Support for Living and Learning with Disabilities comes from Living Innovations, providing support for people with developmental disabilities to have a good life at home and in the community. Services include community connections, which facilitates employment, skill development, and community integration to maximize each individual's well-being and independence. For more information or to learn about job opportunities for compassionate people wishing to do meaningful work, visit livinginnovations.com. And by the Natural Care Wellness Center that has been serving the New Hampshire and Maine Seacoast for 23 years. Our goal is to encourage a healthy lifestyle through education, wellness choices, and hands-on healing. Natural Care Wellness Center offers gentle force chiropractic, family and child wellness, chiropractic acupuncture, holistic nutrition, nutrition response testing, a decompression table, therapeutic exercise, whole food supplements, neuroemotional techniques, and massage therapy. Welcome to Chloe's Shred Shed. I started this small business because I love shredding. I am proud to provide a valuable service in my local community. Being an entrepreneur made it possible for me to keep working during the pandemic. I like working and having a purpose. is an avid naturalist and aspiring entomologist. She is the study of insects and has participated in multiple citizen science projects and volunteer opportunities with organizations such as the New Hampshire Fish and Game, Trout Unlimited, and the Harris Center for Conservation Education. He obtained a bachelor's in biology, art, and the environment from Unity College in Maine. Owen is also a recent graduate of the New Hampshire Leadership Series Class of 2023 and he has a strong desire to make the conservation science field more accessible to those with disabilities and neurodivergent individuals. He currently works at UNH, but he is underemployed and lives in Dover. Today, he will have a chance to tell us about some of the projects he's been working on. Sandra Sonicson is a retired fishery biologist. She worked for a little more than 20 years for the Alaska Department of Fish and Game. She now volunteers with the New Hampshire Fish and Game and Trout Unlimited. She's particularly useful to them because she can easily identify the aquatic invertebrates, animals that lack vertebral columns or backbones that are used as indicators of water quality. Today she will share some of the projects she's working on and her connection working with Owen. Sometimes we miss all those wonderful qualities that we just listed in that last song because we decide who people are before we even get to know them based on maybe what they look like, how they talk, what kind of clothes they're wearing, what kind of music they like, whatever. We decide who they are before we ever get to know who they really are inside. And it happens to us too. Sometimes people decide who we are before they know us. I think all we really want is just for, for people to see us for who we really are. Look for the best in me It's what I really am And all I want to be It may take some time It may be hard to find But see me beautiful See me beautiful Each and every day Could you take a chance Could you find a way To see me shining through in everything I do and see me beautiful mm -hmm. 
see me beautiful look for the best in me it's what i really am and all i want to be it may take some time it may be hard to find but see me beautiful see me beautiful each and every day could you take a chance you find a way to see me shining through in everything I do and see me beautiful. Thank you. Alison Decker. back. I always Allison Decker makes me love the cello every uh, time I hear I know, her. I know. I love that song. It's I like love, you, you can take uh, a Valium or you can listen to this, watch this <laughs> video. You know? I know it's memorize, mesmerizing. <laughs> well, yeah. Hello everyone. Hello. Hello everybody. Hello. I'm going to introduce, I'm, why don't you introduce your friends there? Yeah. Well, I am very excited to uh, be able to have my friend Owen on today with his friend Sandra, who we're getting to meet. Um, I was a, a leader with leadership, UNH leadership this past class, and Owen was in the class. Plus I knew him also prior to that through Abel, New Hampshire, which we've also had guests on from Abel. And I just love this guy and he's, amazing and has so much to offer it's just i want you to hear it because i just can't believe how wonderful this guy is right sandra right <laughs> that's absolutely true yeah yeah now why don't you, right, so why don't you introduce sandra too so we know about her and oh. i well this is the first time i've met sandra so um sandra works has done some volunteering with owen from what he's told me yeah yeah. I think let's no. Owen introduce me. Yeah, ah, sure. I can, I can do okay. that. Okay. Yeah. That would be Sandra way better. And I, okay. Um, we'll get to it. Actually, I think the first time we met was, I think, Sandra, you worked with my dad for a little bit at the library. Yeah. And I then, did. and then through that, I then um, was able to do some um, volunteering um, with the, a, um, national organization called Trout Unlimited. They have a chapter um, local to sort of where my parents live. I was still living with my parents at the time. And um, we were able to really bond through that event where we would go to different sort of locations and do stream surveys of um, the water quality and the diversity of organisms in there, including um, insects and uh, fish. Yep. It was such an enjoyable experience. How young were you when this first hit you that this was coming something you were gonna be interested in the rest mm. of your life? Well, to be honest, insects have always living in rural um, Sutton, New Hampshire, it, I definitely, I was surrounded by insects and my family gardened a lot. So I was often on pest duty. So I got <laughs> sort of interacted with them a lot. And so in a way I've grown up with field guides so, um, what do you know about insects that the average person wouldn't have a clue about? They just see them, and if they if they see them a lot oh, of times, yeah. they just want to kill them or get rid of them. But what what do you? Oh, I've I've saved a bunch of insects that people have like thought, oh, oh my God, it's a giant cockroach, but it's actually not. And so, you know, there's a number of things that people think are cockroaches, but are not. Yeah, pine tree seed bugs, huh? They are always thinking that, yeah. 
Yeah, so. and then there's also the it was I think it was a a giant predatory water bug. Which oh yeah, well, that's scaring me. Now you're scaring me. Giant bug. Wait, fly about, around at night. You're not talking to, about something mate. four foot tall or something now, how, how, because I'm getting scared. They're 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 like that. Like, okay, I can deal yeah. with that. That's I'm okay with that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, that's they. Sandra, no. They'll they'll fly. They migrate for for like between ponds at night in the spring, and so um, they'll be attracted to light. And so if you leave the door open, some will come in. And so it's just like trying to get people not to squish stuff like that. I mean, I think it wasn't until college that I realized that it might be a um, viable study option because I had through through just basic in accident realized that I had had a lot more exposure and experience with there with them just from like doing the gardening this the um plant based stuff um and also uh working um with some of the fishery sort of side of things there's a lot of sort of overlap hmm. and i had a a really good um uh, uh entomology teacher um in college that uh really um made me excited for it in ways that I hadn't necessarily thought. I mean, I tend to be the person who do not get projects done early. I am not one of those people, but we had a, like a collection. You had to collect a certain number of insects and I and, and identify them and then um, present it at the end. And I found out by accident, I was literally the first person done in the class because I just, kept running into them yeah you know and that's a that was a big part of um owens and my volunteering with trout unlimited is it's a uh, us and um one or two biologists from fishing game who aren't entomologists they're fishery biologists and then a bunch of other volunteers and owen and i were really the only two we discovered who could actually tell without it being difficult could tell a mayfly from a stonefly yeah. from you know i mean it's only to family it isn't that hard but um yeah really we were very important because otherwise people would have been getting all the wrong data people were the other volunteers yeah no it couldn't do it and so yeah it was really fun and it was really great i've done it some without owen now because he hasn't always been able to be available in the last years or right. so but i'm on the so other side of the state so much easier when there were two of us who could do that and um, yeah so yeah and that so, too yeah. you know, it, that no, makes a big you guys are a good team i'm sorry I didn't mean to... yeah. yeah yeah no no it's it's that's why i'm really happy that we're going to be able to participate in the lebanon river student lebanon i can't remember the order um <laughs> Uh, it's, it's, the Lebanon Student Watershed Congress. Yeah. I think right. that's the order, but that's, um, that's it's actually, an event where you get to teach fourth graders how to sort of do the stream surveys, and it's it's really fun. And I mean, yeah. it made me less intimidated to working with uh, children around because that's right. definitely not yeah. necessarily yeah. my wheelhouse as much oh but you would never know yeah. that i mean Owen was just really really great the first year that we did it we didn't know all they asked was for us to volunteer for this and i knew the person who had been volunteering before us was a disabled older man you know um and i knew that he would just be sitting at a table and so i assumed that that's what we would be doing and owen and i showed up and found out that in fact, we needed chest waders, big top boots, and um, that we would be taking kids in the river all day. And neither of us had any 
chest waders with us. So we went in just in our pants all day. Um, and the kids, the river is full of um, like potholes and stuff. So you have to be careful that you don't get a fourth grader stepping up, up to their neck. And, and there's, I don't know how many kids. It, it's every 20 minutes, a whole nother group arrives all day. It was just crazy. And Owen, the kids were in love with him. He was so calm and so great getting them positioned in the stream. And I think we only had two fall in. So we did. Yeah, <laughs> no, it was not bad. One was on purpose, I'm sure. So, so uh, you know, um, actually, Owen was the wonderfully calming presence in this crazy situation. Uh, not only was there a lot of water and all that, but there were also a lot of kids whose response, it was like a theatrical response to insects was to scream. And so we had that going on all day. Oh, yeah. Made me jump every, every time. Oh. So, some of the ways that kids can reach that high pitch is just, you know. <laughs> yeah. But, you know. For the first 20 kids, it was just kind of like, oh, isn't that fun? And by the last 20 kids, we were yeah. like, oh, no. yeah. <laughs> yeah. You, you know, Owen, I'm serious. I, you know, I, only because I, I, you know, I write children's books myself, but I think there's a children's book here where you can say, here's this, here's this uh, insect. Why is it important to the environment? You know, you could, it doesn't yeah. have to be some big scholarly thing you need a PhD for. You could, it's really then the kids then the kids would be more respectful of, of of life all around them and not be just wanting to squash them a, definitely well, i think that was oh i think for me good at these settings too is he was very um straightforward to the kids that you know yeah this this isn't gonna hurt you you know and a very right. calm voice right. well i had a tendency to go don't worry about it you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's it's scaring the kids, right? Don't worry about it. What's wrong uh, with you? I mean, <laughs> never mind. Yeah. Oh, and you that, would, think, that would, you'd be great with that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I like think the, I think the main thing is you know just um you gotta sort of like don't dumb down the information, but just make sure that you're your um sharing it and yeah. i think um some of my um neurology helps with that and i mean it i think uh that being in the field and helping kids in that way is I think the place that I can do that if I'm like trying to do a lecture in front of people of, of that with like no props or anything like that that would have been a lot harder yeah actually I think this the, the approach that we had thought we were going to do would have been actually harder for both of us you know I thought we were going to sit at a yeah, table and yeah. get these kids interested and that wasn't what we do so yeah, it was really a great experience. Mm -hmm. And I think that you're it it's not only the idea of a kid's book. Yeah, that that'd be nice. There are kids' books about that, and none of them are really inspiring, I have to say. But but um another thing is they they hand the fish and game has a guide to the invertebrates that they hand to the kids. It's a two-sided one sheet. And it's just a poorly mimeographed black and white pictures right. of yeah. they all kind of look the same and it's really uninspiring and I know my dream is that Owen would get employed he gets a contract to make a new two-sided sheet that's <clears throat> photos and um, here's this insect as uh, immature in the stream and here's what it looks like as an adult flying in the air you know I think right. that would speak to the kids so much better and, the, and that's an example of something that is just waiting to be done, you know. Yeah, so. no. not, not, and, to belabor, and, not to belabor the subject, but it's so easy to go to Amazon and, and, and uh, you know, they'll, they'll, you, know, you can put yeah. a book on Amazon, mm -hmm. you can do it all and get it published on Amazon and it'll be there. For right, you. right. Well, I mean, even, it doesn't need to be something that's available everywhere. I, yeah. I 
you know, this yeah. is going to be New Hampshire's guide for yeah. kids of what you find yeah. if you turn yeah. over a rock in a stream, you know? Yeah. I think I, I know that there's a lot of people like on Instagram who uh, there's one person I follow who does who's like a, a master's um, a student um, for entomology and does all these posts about insects and um, sort of will put a lot of info on there and they do a really good job and so I've tried to do a little bit of that with mine but it's hard to keep up I tend to take more photos than I'm able to sort of oh, yeah. keep up with everybody I mean, does that. that's part that's yeah. the downside of the ADHD piece because that um, means that you like will try and take photos of everything you see and that's mm -hmm. just not possible yeah my son tries he take he does the same thing he takes all these photos he's like ADHD too and he and then he needs to edit every single one. And then there's because he wants them all to be perfect. And then, you know, yeah. But, so uh, I've been know. more dis discerning now, but yeah. you know, still. But I think yeah. what really for this function and for lots of things, like when we're volunteering with those volunteers on the side of a stream, you can't have Instagram, you can't have anything like that. You need this physical yeah, no. pack of cards or yeah. a piece of paper that you hand to them. Right. So they're. Okay. Front of them, you know. I, I think sharing my wonder of that sort of world mm -hmm. and just the um, amazement that's sort of what is my goal because yeah. whenever I'm doing that because it's just when you see the world in a way that is so rich in a way that you know other people may just see oh it's just flying insects it's a whole mass or something like that, or or like when you just see the forest, but you don't see the trees, that sort of analogy. I mm -hmm. mean, it can be literal, like once you know the different species, it becomes much more colorful in a sense and exciting. And that's something that regardless of whether it's insects or or other natural pieces. That's the kind of thing that I just have always wanted to share. And I've always been that way. As a, as a kid, I went um, Halloween trick-or-treating as a chambered nautilus, <laughs> which is a um, type of cephalopod that, um, I mean, I've been that way since I was, was a kid. I, I can picture you going into a, a store and for that would have costumes and saying, I want a chambered Nautilus costume. If I'm going to go out on a holiday. My, my so dad is crafty, was crafty <laughs> enough so that he was able to make it for me. But I know Owen's I didn't dad. go trick or treating that often, but you know. Oh, it's But dad. you know. Could you tell a little bit about. Um... You mentioned employment. Just um, do you mind going? Just starting back with like, what do you your education? You you've done so yeah. much, and then what are your what are the obstacles you're finding now that you have all your degrees? Well, um, yeah, no, I after graduating from high school, I think especially since I am have a um invisible disability there was a lot of assumption that I was going to go to college and the college I chose was um uh um an environmental college that was a small college up in sort of rural Maine um that um had all these really cool majors that was for me hard to choose which major I wanted. So um, I uh, I did really like the school, especially since they had um, some uh, a pretty good um, supports program for uh, classes in terms of getting accommodations for testing and all that sort of thing. Um, 
I I eventually sort of I've always been interested in art as well and so I was able to double major in art and biology but given my uh, disabilities which are include ADHD developmental dyspraxia and a couple of others which even the people who tested me aren't necessarily sure what I what exactly they know it's a developmental dis other developmental disability pieces but they haven't actually diagnosed me with mm. other pieces but um uh basically um were you they accepted? How, were you accepted when you? How were you treated by the other students? I was I was accepted. It was it's been interesting. I was I was accepted pretty well. I think there's because it was a science school, and because I was in uh, science was a strong suit for me my um disabilities didn't necessarily show as readily um they're inconsistent in when they show up and so i think there's a lot of people who genuinely teach professors who i gen who genuinely enjoyed my company and all that but it it the trans i it was, um, I don't think I necessarily knew enough to get a, much support outside of the classroom. Like when it came to the um, sort of requirements for graduation and that sort of stuff. But um, I got accepted because I, my grades were good and um i was able to um and they um uh were um i seemed like the type of person that they would want to ha want to um recruit because they were very much about like sort of environmental and sciences and and that um, and I sort of fit that sort of category fairly well. Um, but uh, they had a really nice sort of peer so, um, learning resource center in there where you had peer tutors that would help you with um, tests or um, assignments. And in that peer tutor, they had all the math teachers together having their classrooms in there. So regardless what math class you had, you could have help from any of the math teachers. And, they, and when anybody had like a math issue, they'd all sort of help out and, and, and like, okay, what do you need sort of thing. But um, I think... So you were pretty much accepted I, by the other students and the teachers and no trouble there? Yeah, I think there was definitely moments where people were like, oh, I didn't realize you had a disability or moments where people would be like, where the way they noticed would be when I would speak because of my dyspraxia affects my um, fluency and um, word sort of order. And that definitely can affect how I come across. It makes it hard to li listen to recordings of myself, but- mm. um, I tell you, you're very easy for me to listen to you. I, I, I find it almost soothing, you know? I don't you like- You should hear me when I'm tired. <laughs> <laughs> is it better or worse? I mean, would I like you worse? 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 Would you like? Oh uh, yeah, no. I I don't. I I don't have a gradient. I go. I go straight from 
from good to crap. <laughs> well, I never noticed that on the end of the day, you were always still going strong. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So who's, I'm yeah. not noticing. No, I mean, yeah, what are you talking when I'm working about on here? something that's energizing, there's the whole yeah, ADHD hyper focus that, yeah. you know, that that will help me and give me energy back. But um, when it comes to like, either being tired or stressed or overwhelmed like i have some sensory stuff too that um sensory processing makes it a little bit me slower in terms of that so oh, in certain do, areas do you think that affects um job interviews do you, if you get anxious at job interviews is that a problem oh yeah i tend to try and front load everything and so that can make things um not ordered like i will say all these um job um interview um things that i have written down but would would have been questions that they would ask eventually and i would and i think that might have scared or unnerved people and yeah. I think also because my dyspraxia also in affects my motor planning too in terms of my coordination and so all of that together means that I'm a non-driver at this point um I've been tested um for the potential, but um, that involves, that would be the equivalent of going back to school in terms of the level of commitment and energy involved. And I don't act, since I don't have somebody to practice with, that um, feasibility wise, I would not be able to hold my own job um, and do that at the same time, which some of those things people don't see that because they don't necessarily see, oh, just get your license. I've had a certain number of coworkers who've said that to me when I said I haven't gotten a, I don't have a license. Yeah, I think it's a big deal that in this country we're so. Especially poor. the state. Yeah. And yeah, mm. right. And we we really assume that, and it affects not just people who have disabilities, but also people who don't have a lot of money. You know, we just assume that you can get around, and um, yeah. that your ability to get around uh, allows you to pick and choose among available jobs and to negotiate salary. Really, there's no way to get around for a lot of people, and they end up with jobs that aren't good enough for them that don't right. demonstrate their abilities because we don't consider them. And we don't, I mean, society as a whole would benefit of course so much if we didn't all have to have a car available 24 seven. Right. It's just wrong. My, my son's best friend is in Austria, Vienna. And he is in his near the end of his twenties and has never bothered to learn to drive. He doesn't need to. <laughs> think right. of that in this country you know it's just it's just very unfortunate i think there's ways around it i think you could still get a good job but oh, you have to do the heavy lifting to make that work you know and and it makes employers nervous i mean yeah, but, you but know this... like as soon as i might be having a really good interview but like as soon as it's like you have to work weekends and the bus doesn't run on Sundays. And if they say that, then it becomes something that like, they're like, oh, we don't know if that'll work because that's non-negotiable or You're something right. to that effect. Yeah, but you're and missing, well, you guys are missing something here. Because my daughter came back from Sweden. She's a scientist, a nutrition scientist. And she works for Lanza, which is a worldwide company. She oh, doesn't yeah. leave. She doesn't leave her house. She there's and and she was telling me she says, "Dad, there's all these jobs now. It's changing. The COVID years changed employers. 
and they don't want to go back to, to the fact that everybody has to come into the office. He said, yeah, but you know, yeah, we're you can field do work. Yeah, we're yeah. talking. Yeah, that's the only. Right. You got it. That's yeah, certain sectors. Out. Yeah. The, there's really the the conservation or ecology so, or or mm -hmm. or uh, natural sciences, for lack of a better term. That sector is really very much stuck in old sort of um, pattern, and they don't have that flex. They're only starting to get that flexibility, and it's only going to certain sort of sections. It's not transverse. It's not um, throughout the the industry, which is hard. I mean. Literally, I talked to a state agency. I'm not going to name names because this is going on TV, but um, there was one agency where I was there directly talking to HR, asking about if this department would get, be willing to offer um, a position, non-driver positions in the future, and they gave me a flat out no. And that's like a whole entire department, which I think is, you know, it's one thing if it's like certain sort of positions, but you got to have diversity and flexibility and that sort of thing. And a lot of these jobs, you need to have sort of these basic jobs that are not really accessible or stable in order for you to tra traverse to get to more stable jobs. That's very true. And that, that is what I was gonna talk about is that there is, um, you know, agencies and nonprofits that are in natural resources, they're chronically underfunded and they really are at the same time, good people who are really driven to accomplish what they're doing. It isn't like they're, selling marshmallows to people they're doing things they really believe in and so it gets down to them really um being wanting to get the last drop out of their employees budget and ways they can do that is to hire a lot of temporary people use a lot of people oh, yeah. at the bottom you know and and then also to um get people to do a lot of um things with their own money like my uh, fishing game that i work for and it's long enough into now long ago and nobody in alaska is going to be listening to this i think so i can say my gosh we had army surplus vehicles was what we had and so if you really actually wanted to get somewhere i had to drive it's alaska i had to drive 40 miles one time with a truck that the window wouldn't roll up in it in the middle of the winter it was freezing cold. anyway um so if you really wanted to be able to do anything, you used your own car, you used a lot of your own resources, and you worked a lot of overtime, always for free. Mm -hmm. So, you know, agencies really are trying to eke the last dollar out of their employees. And so that's not to their advantage. It's not a good thing. And they, I don't think they mean to be doing that, but it happens. And so that is true for me. I, you know, I was a summer employee for a few years doing crazy things i had a master's degree and still had to start at the bottom partly because i was a woman in a time when women didn't do this kind of work but um you know that's a given and that means that you need to be able to support yourself for a lot of the year doing something else you know and um it's not easy but that doesn't mean that's the way it should be or that it's all like that and um you know owen's already done a lot of that you know, proving himself part, I think. And so in a better world, and maybe even in this world, there's a place to get that step in. I, th you know? I think it's it's hard. I mean, with my, with my sort of invisible disability, I think there's like a lot of sort of like what I look like in paper and what I look like outside of paper. And I think, um, mm -hmm. The, the problem is I, I end up getting relegated to being a professional volunteer in terms of like, that's my sort of job mm -hmm. in a sense. 
or, or career in a sense, which there is very little opportunities to advance too far. And part of the issue is too, that it's super competitive, like San Sandy was talking about that if you don't get a, if you don't, like have something that makes you stand out like whether that's a license or a or a master's or or even just a lot of summer uh position before this um you are gonna always come across people who have better resumes for this because they've had you're ha you're competing with neurotypical able-bodied people that you know in order to make somewhere some of these places they can't just have that little slap little um equal uh what is it equal opportunity um employer logo or encourage people with disabilities to apply they have to actually actively re recruit it and mean that means making it prioritizing those people in those positions like the way they do in tech and engineering and in some of those areas they're lacking in the in the inclusion in the s part of 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 steam right they are and i think science you know, tech, technology and math mm -hmm. and and you know the agency i worked with got federal money you know, state fish and game yeah. agencies a lot of federal money through license sales and um, sales of fishing and hunting equipment and so every single report we ever wrote we put that equal opportunity statement on the bottom of it and yeah. um you know and I think that if you'd asked us, we would say that we would do that. We believed in that, but um, hiring, it gets sort of ingrained. You hire the people who look like yourself. It's just the way it is and who have your skill set. And I know from my career, you know, I was one of the first women to get in field biology in a state like Alaska. And, and, um, I ended up with the office jobs. I mean, I had great jobs. I, I did statistical analysis and wrote reports and I did field work too, but mostly took other people's data that they could not analyze themselves and I did it for them. So the situation that had evolved was that we hired people who could back a trailer and set a net and then and we accepted that they couldn't do data analysis or write papers or I identify invertebrates, actually, that too, I ended up doing. Um, we accepted that, but we would not have accepted that they couldn't back a trailer, you know, and so that meant that we didn't recognize a whole skill set that was necessary. And it all got loaded on a, a few for a large yeah, I, 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 hope, I hope people who are watching this video realize that we are a long way from being an enlightened society. We're so much in the dark ages in so many areas, you know. Right. I mean, anybody can see your talent, you know, Sandra, and, and Owen's talent is, you know, everything mm -hmm. else should be uh, just superfluous. you got the talent. you got the ability. Yeah. Well, you, you know, but I'm dependent upon the, the person who can, I can't back a trailer for a darn. No, so no, I, I know that. that yeah. I mean, I could do it, but it might end up off the ramp. But, <laughs> but um, yeah. you know, I think that, that the recognition that there are different skill sets that are necessary yeah. and that it would be good if we could have a group that accomplished the whole thing, the whole, yeah. and recognize that right. we need, because, you know, um, things have not changed that much. I mean, some of the people that I really had to do all that work for and who didn't even really notice my presence now are leading an agency, you know? So, so it's just um, a recognition of 
the variety of talents that are needed and in a and a willingness to hire aiming for other talents than back in the boat you know and so i think that i mean but then there's the immediate well so what does a person who wants to enter this field right now do you know and um right i think that's um well we need to get really creative in our thinking fast <laughs> oh yeah often. I, I've definitely had to take the quote unquote scenic route. Like I know that there's plenty of people in sort of like who graduated similar time frame for me that are already sort of probably have their P definitely have their masters, probably have their PhD. And mm -hmm. so, you know, it's, um, Difficult. I mean, it was difficult for me when I went to college. I took five and a half years to graduate. And even then I um even then I um the half of the year was because I needed to do my internship out outside of the actual college time frame. So um I had to literally and in order for that, I literally had to create my own internship. Essentially, it was a glorified volunteer position at Dartmouth College, their life science green greenhouse, the one with the corpse flower. Um, <laughs> uh, that that one, oh, they were amazing people to work with, and I just really loved. Uh, working with them and I they were able to help me with finding a ride share to in order to do that which I paid like ten dollars in order to go back and forth which worked out really well and I got to bond with those people as well and it was really nice in that sense but um when it came time they re did want to hire me but they couldn't because there were no positions available. And once a position showed up, I did get interviewed and went through all the rigmarole, but um, they ended up having to pass on me because it wasn't just them that were hiring. It was also like the department heads and all that stuff. And so there were people who were more experienced and had more qualifications in that stuff sense, even though this was a entry level position. And so there's situations like that where um, I've had to be creative and that has me meant that my experience hasn't matched the um standard cookie cutter approach and doing job applications is very exhausting for me and takes a lot of effort so i am not one of those people that can whip out an application or multiple applications like do five or more applications a week or something like that which i know there's people who do 10 but I, I I can barely do two sometimes. And part of that is my disabilities make that a little slower, but also because, I mean, there's, I'll be honest, there's, it can get very dis demoralizing when you have the same sort of responses over and over and realizing that this isn't necessarily going to change and that's even necessary but, but that's even if you're looking at internships oh and listen to me we this kind of reminds me of where we were as a country uh you know during civil rights where you know people of color couldn't get hired you know or mm -hmm. things like it's just it's just the same thing it's like it's just it's just the same prejudice but it's wearing different clothes and it, it yeah. pretends, and it pretends it's not the same. It's no different than the racism of the past. 
It's it's in the same and, and category. They've judged you before after overlap. two minutes of knowing you, and you can't know anybody in two minutes. Right. It, yes. And and hold keep and, on, keep this tape and use this tape in the future. Use this yeah. tape. Let them see you. Yeah. I mean, this will save you a lot of time. This is who I am. You know. I think for me, it's like I can have I can have people who. I get the two extremes because it's an invisible disability. Yeah. I get um, people who see me as a, an amazing person that, you know, they don't necessarily see the effort and they don't necessarily see me as um, disabled or, or anything like that. <laughs> but, um, or, or they don't see the struggle. And then there are those who um uh do don't see me outside of the disability and they um will um underestimate me and so it's been a challenge to have people see both and i've definitely had to bushwhack for a lot for for in terms of trailblazing my um my uh path it's been exhausting and i've de definitely been looking i'm still looking for any mentors i can i can have sandy's been a very good one so far well yeah no, and i think what you need to be able to get is people who see you as a scientist and they don't see they don't care about the rest yeah you know and, that, that's and you know, um, I, and I, I was, I described problems, but you know, I, there's also really great things that can happen. I mean, um, I know that the agency I work for was really supportive of people. They really, all of us many times went way out of our way to be supportive of people who had problems. And, you know, yeah. we had a, 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 one of my coworkers got a, had a neurodegenerative disease and, you know, he worked in the field to begin with, he was a field worker. And in the end, he worked, you know, we accommodated his disability all the way through. And, and um, you know, that we all did that. We all really felt that that was important. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that it isn't so much that in this particular way, I don't think it's so much prejudice in those terms. It's lack of imagination. I think that yeah. people, um, you know, like I say, we have an image. We all do of what a fishery biologist looks like, you know? And, and so it's hard to see outside that box, even if we mean yeah. to. And so I think that it's a matter of convincing people to look at it differently or, and to make them aware of other talents that they actually need, you know? I mean, I have read reports yeah. produced by some agencies that are so bad, <laughs> you think, oh my gosh, you know, who wrote this? And that's because they didn't realize they need to hire somebody who's yeah. good at public communication. You know, um, communicating yeah. scientific data is, I mean, there's the communication of, oh, isn't this an interesting thing about octopuses? Yeah. But then there's also the communication of here's this hard science that we know and that that is, this hard science needs to be understood by um, those who control budgets so that we can do the right thing. And so good scientific papers are also really important. And boy, I, I, I see that not being done as rigorously as it was in the past. And that concerns me. And, and um, the public's appetite for real science is less and less. And so anyway, I think that, yeah, it takes some forward thinking and some understanding of what needs to happen for an agency to thrive. And um, that means you look a little further afield when you're looking for your employees. I, I, just I think creativity is, is, is the most important thing that they, they and not just as um, sort of like um, uh, inter, uh, not sort of the um, science not just for um like the supervisors and the bosses but from like the 
the um, HR departments that like there's a lot of it where I was getting a lot of roadblocks from HR more so than um, uh, the actual people who I would be interviewing with, with which who would be um, uh, uh, who would be um, interested and supportive and uh, some even offered to give me tips on how to get um, to go forward in the industry and stuff so, like oh, that. So, Just real quick, when you're saying you have blocks or you've seen the blocks from HR, now, not I don't know if that's a surprise to me, but HR, I mean, it's supposed to be all inclusive and it seems like companies are working very hard to make sure that that is done. So how... How would you have anybody told you how to maybe get around that so that you can get to those field people or those people that want to work with you? What are the obstacles that they're throwing at you? Well, it's a policy thing. So like there's a lot of policies in uh, like specifically um, certain age, state agencies like fish and game or other or other ones oh, will have time. requirements that um, require you to have um, a driver's license oh, to work okay. in that so. in that department. And they will not even look at any sort of applications that do not do that. So they're the ones weeding out everything else. So, so your, your application will not huge. even get submitted. I got to say that is really bad. <laughs> you know? It is. I mean, well, that's why awful. I'm asking. It's really yeah. awful. And yeah, our transportation yeah, so, for you uh, is a huge, huge roadblock. Yeah. No yeah, pun there, uh, but yes. <laughs> I mean, well, maybe, you uh -huh. know, I lived in a state where there were a lot of people who came in from villages and places that really driving, what were you going to do with a car in some of those places? So maybe yeah. that's why that was yeah. just not even a consideration. Now, New Hampshire is, we've been you know, legislatively been working on trying to make better transportation accessible for the state yeah. it is it's a huge issue i'm um i want to thank you for yeah thank you for spilling out your guts here really yeah not the stuff. easiest thing to do no that, thank you great. feel yeah. like there's so much more to talk about but uh, yeah we could go all, we can come back <laughs> You come back, come back. You come back and tell yeah. us a happy story like you're the head of some big technological company yeah yeah <laughs> yeah and no, you know you're, you're welcome to come back. We've got, you know, our next yeah. season. If you cannot fly, if you cannot fly, if you cannot fly, I will lift you up and tell you that I love you. If you cannot fly, if you cannot fly, if you cannot fly, I will lift you up and tell you that I love you. As we travel through this life, there is trouble, there is strife, and some days seem dreary and so long. But with courage on our side, there's no need to run and hide. We can lift our wings and learn to fly. If you cannot fly, if you cannot fly, if you cannot fly, I will lift you up and tell you that I love you. If you cannot fly, if you cannot fly, if you cannot fly, I will lift you up and tell you that I love you. Now today may not seem bright, cause we cannot see the light, and there's thick black darkness all around. We can soar up to the clouds and ignore the angry crowds, we must lift our wings and learn to fly if you cannot fly if you cannot fly 
If you cannot fly, I will lift you up and tell you that I love you. If you cannot fly, if you cannot fly, if you cannot fly, I will lift you up and tell you that I love you. And if fate will be our friend, There'll be peace around the bend No more tears for us to cry If you cannot fly If you cannot fly If you cannot fly I will lift you up and tell you that I love you If you cannot fly If you cannot fly if you cannot fly, I will lift you up and tell you that I love you. I will lift you up and tell you that I